uh, might not know, I'm Tom Williams. I'm Chair of Humanities here at UHV. And I want to thank everybody for coming out today. And as usual, I'd like at the beginning of these introductions to remind you that this is a good time to power off any uh, cell phones or handheld devices. Um, I think the fine is up to $20, to 20 for anyone that goes off inappropriately. That's right. But it's... Uh, I'm introducing today the last speaker for the 2010-2011 American Book Review Reading Series, Rolando Hinojosa-Smith, who is as distinguished and renowned a writer as would befit such an occasion. What makes this event all the more special is that it represents the first collaboration between American Book Review's reading series in Central Victoria, the Chicano Cultural Center on the UHV campus that many of you are beginning to see as yet another reason why UH Victoria is an institution like no other. Um, so let me say a few things about Professor Hinojosa before stepping aside. Texas native, born and reared in the Rio Grande Valley. Professor Hinojosa is also a graduate of the University of Texas. He earned subsequent graduate degrees at New Mexico Highlands University and his Ph.D. at the University of Illinois. His academic career is taken at the Trinity University, the former Texas A&I in Kingsville, the University of Minnesota, the one that doesn't quite fit into the, <laughs> the chain, and finally his alma mater in Austin, where he is currently the Ellen Clayton Garwood Professor of English. Pre Professor Hinojosa's fiction has earned him many honors, such as the Premio Quinto Sol, the National Award for Chicano Literature, as well as the Premio Casa de las Americas, the highest award for a Latin American novel, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Texas Institute of Letters. His work has been translated into French, German, Italian, Spanish, and Japanese. His numerous novels show a command of language and range of themes and versatility of form little seen among today's writers. Adept with the detective story with his series of Rafe Buenrostro novels, uh, Dashiell Hammett with a Texas twang, according to the Dallas Morning News. He is also, like William Faulkner, created on his own postage stamp of soil in his epic Clail City Death Trip, a series of novels chronicling families of Mexican and Anglo descent over the course of generations living in uh, Hinojosa's fictional Belkin County, Clail City, and Baronas, Mexico. A reviewer in the New York Times took pains to say that Hinojosa captures a place, its people, and time in a masterly way his work goes far beyond regionalism. He is a writer for all readers. First hand have I seen this magic this semester, where in my Composition two class I had to work hard to convince some of my students that the people and places in Ask a Policeman were not real, but works of the imagination. <laughs> Clearly, Professor Hinojosa has succeeded in what Nathaniel Hawthorne told all us fiction writers years ago, to dream strange dreams and make them seem like truth. It is indeed an honor to introduce Dr. Rolando Hinojosa-Smith, an international treasure, a national treasure, and, of course, a Texas treasure. I ask you to join me, American Book Review, UHV, and Central Victoria in welcoming today. It may not surprise you that I wrote that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to say something good about yourself. This is the time. Can you all hear me okay? Is, is this on? It's the one in the black one in the middle. Of this. These are the ones? Yes. Can you hear me now? How about back there? You're falling asleep. Right? <laughs> How about now? I'm serious. Can you really hear me? <laughs> uh, the theme uh, may not be a very pleasant, but it uh, has to do with a war uh, that is almost forgotten by... Uh, people my age, unfortunately, it's the Korean War. And that'll be the theme for today. Uh, I'll begin, uh, the first two pieces come from Korean Love Songs, which has been translated into German, called Korea Liebisch Lieder. And uh, it's about accidents uh, during combat, either at the beginning, at the onset, or during the fight. This has to do with friendly fire, which uh, has been known for years by artillerymen when you kill accidentally someone from your own type. And it's followed by another theme, uh, which is seldom mentioned, uh, although now with the war in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, and I imagine now the loss of Tim Hetherington in Libya, uh, suicide, but not in his case. Okay. This is friendly fire. It says, light travels faster than sound, but sound travels fast enough for some. The burned hand caught the shrapnel directly and sailed off as the arm shot upward looking for his partner, how partly buried in the mud. 
The hip, too, felt the smoking clumps of steel, which now don't have to be surgically removed. That wire laying Sigelman is as good as dead. The spent shell bounces and clangs with the others, and the hangman's lanyard sways and waits to reactivate the howitzer. Sometimes, however, sound doesn't travel far enough and fast enough. Raise those sights, Sergeant Kell. The forward observer says you're still firing short. Still, sound travels fast enough for some, as it did for them, who heard the first scream in time to hug the sodden field. And now I'll read what happened as a consequence. One of our forward observers uh, was a friend of mine. I was a tanker, by the way, which is artillery. Uh, I think it was Paul Freeman, one of the regimental commanders, asked another regimental commander under him at the time named Mike, Mike Kalis. He said, what are tanks for? He said, to kill. That was his complete answer. So this is called, above all, the waste. Lieutenant Phil Bratke up and shot himself two days ago. We found his helmet, the binoculars, the paper, two packs of Raleigh cigarettes, and a Japanese lighter, all in a row. We found him face down, half in, half out of his forward observer's hole. He used to say he was a Philadelphia Jew doing time. Now, for once, he was wrong. He was a friend. He was resourceful and kind, calm, precise, and something that many of us here are not. He was very good at his job, and yet he cracked, as I imagine many of us will in time. My God, but I hate to see the letter that commanding officer will send off to his family. Maybe, maybe just once he'll do the right thing. You recommend him for the Purple Heart and the Brown Star, and then leave the letter writing to one of the other officers. This is one of the charges that young officers, I was one, uh, we had to write to the parents, personal letter. Uh, this is called Notes from, I've not read this in public, so I uh, hope it works. It's called Notes from a Forgotten War, comma, so-called. Yes, it's about Korea. And that war, brief as it was, was briefer still for the 57,000 casualties. And passing, in 14 years in Vietnam, the casualties rate ranged from 57 to 58,000. The Korean War continues to be referred to when it's referred to at all, as a forgotten war. Forgotten? Oh yeah. But not by those who survived, nor for the widows, parents, children, and all manner of relatives and acquaintances who lost a continuation of future bloodlines. How could they forget? But it's forgotten by fellow citizens who are now older and enjoying, one would hope, the golden years in return. As for the young, well, what experiences can they remember since the war ended in a truce more than a half century ago? But again, for those of us who haven't forgotten the following notes with some commentary somewhat <coughs> abated by the passing years may serve as a bit of history. History, by the way, which was called for notes that I made, beginning <coughs> excuse me, with a brief stay in old Japan in a military base in southern Honshu, and followed with the invasion by the North Korean People's Army, who on the day after Thanksgiving were joined by Chinese volunteers. We'd be home uh, for Christmas. That's what they told us. General MacArthur said we would, and uh, we believed it. That was an innocent thought. The Chinese... Down they came on that freezing November day across the river and into the Korean hills and plains, bugles blaring, and no, it wasn't a million. It was about 300,000, but it looked like that. Our executive officer, Anthony John, had fought in the European War, and he steadied us as best he could, given the troops he was leading. But I'm writing from memory here, and I'll go into the notes for now. It was a waste of it all. Phil Bratke up and shot himself ago. Two days ago, orderly as always. We'll miss him. Bratke used to say he was a Philadelphia Jew. As for the Bratke family, their reward will consist of a telegram, most likely stating that he was wounded in action first, followed by a letter from our commanding officer repeating what all commanding officers say, a good soldier who gave his all. The Purple Heart will follow when those in charge of the mail get around to it. We later learned that the winter of 50 and 51 was the coldest, most severest, and blinding winter 
of the 20th century. But you had to be there to appreciate it. Beaten fair and square, although some of our men helped by running away. One outfit, no, not forgotten by those of us who were there, abandoned their cannon, the ammo, the breech blocks and sights, and what shame they must have had at one time. As Johnny Turpak said, running and screaming for mommy and home. The battle police... The battle police are the military police, except when they're fighting. The battle police brought them back, of course. Where did they go? They had no idea where they were. The language, Korean, Chinese, forget it. But they were fed, and back they came. From the notes again. The word is out. Quite early this morning, under guard, the 88th field was marched back to retrieve its gun. For the battalion's own good and discipline, it is said. Yesterday they cut and ran. Worse. They abandoned their guns and shells, their blocked and sights, and every bit of equipment to then issue and entrust. And where does one go at a retreat? Well, the answers are clear. Not far and not for long. Yesterday, in the midst of fear and fire, officers and noncoms yelled themselves hoarse to no avail. Stop, you sons of bitches. Hold it right there, you bastards, for Christ's sake. Hold your ground. To no avail. They ran and worse. They quit their guns. So, for their own good, they were marched right back to the entrenched camp. From Kujandong, we had supplied the fire, which, along that of armor, rid the Chinese and cut them to pieces. What we didn't kill, the Air Force did. And those who were left, up they scurried into Chinaman's hat, unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, abandoning their dead. So, early this morning, the 88th field was herded up, fed, talked to, and marched off unto guard to retrieve the guns. Years later, and now a grandfather, it's not difficult for me to think about those men. Cowards? All? No. Inexperienced. And green, the officer said. How true. There are a few soft, soft jobs for ground troops. Period. The retreat and that freeze-your-butt-cold bought a surprise. We were assigned a rearguard position. It's a tough way to earn one's money. With Brodke gun and Lieutenant John shot by a sniper through the throat, as he walked out of the latrine. The sergeants, Dumas, Hatowski, and Fraser, took over. Our assignment, picking up stragglers. I remember Dumas giving me a stub of a number two Everhart paper, paper pe saying, uh, here you are, scribe. Stragglers, the poorest of the poor. Divorced and with no support, the old sergeant said. Picked up. <laughs> saved, really. We saved 30 or more. Here's something from the notes. Moving south, picking up stragglers and other lost souls. Yesterday evening, while we were busy checking, polishing, and babying the guns over and over, Hatowski brought in another straggler with death written all over him. Here's another mouth to feed, he said. A company clerk whose company abandoned him. He was left to guard cabinets crammed with shot, leave, and pay records, along with the usual morning reports. He carried an unloaded carbine, and there were no rounds on his person. Well, Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Company Clerk, said Fraser. And with this, he gets down on his knees. To a man, we turn away. And it's back to the guns. After a minute or two, softly, <clears throat> Fraser says, When you're through, chappy, give us a hand with the elbow grease. He keeps crying, but he's willing to work. How long had you been there when the sergeant found you? Since last night. And they just left you there. But they said they'd be back. Where are we headed now? We're going south. We're going to Kunari. But what artillery outfit is this? This is the 219th. The 219th? You're attached to the 2nd Division. And Fraser laughed and said, We're assigned, but we're not attached. And the clerk nods, and reaching into his pocket, he pulls out a Baby Ruth wrapper, and it takes a small bite off the frozen candy bar. Well, I'll eat soon, Fraser tells him, and he nods again. The Chinese saw me standing there by the cabinets. They saw me, and they walked right by. They waved. Some of them waved at me. Yeah, they're just ahead. Ahead of us? Uh, setting up roadblocks, most probably. <clears throat> Jesus. We'll get out. We'll burn the hills, and we'll burn them, too. Jesus. At the Blue Bar, the only drinking place in my hometown now, a guy my age named Galvan, remember the wounded. <clears throat> Do you remember that old man, a brig general? He was something. Galvan would have gone on, but a youngster came up, and this shot is up. This was none of his business. I remember the general, all right. This is from the notes. That old man picked up one of the wounded and put him in the truck all by himself. And then he waved at us. 
walk to the rear, which was really one of the fronts. There was a time I was helping Hataski put a Turk in one of the trucks. I slipped on the ice and didn't want to get up. I was cold, tired, hungry, and felt sorry for myself. And Hat knew that when he said, here, as he handed me my helmet, you may need this. I also saved the following. The old-looking general returned with Colonel Keith and waved at us again. We'll move when we can. When night falls, have your men deployed and the artillerymen ready. Intelligence says the woods are full, so fire high and we'll save our infantry. The sun's going down, Tom. We would all get through. Pass the word. We would all get through, he repeated. And he waved that hat at me again as we helped one more wounded man inside the truck. Who were those men? No idea. No names. No interest in who they were. Rhode Islanders, Montanans, Carolinians, who, who cared? We didn't. They were wounded, and they were ours. <coughs> what do they do after the war if they survived? I have photos from an old 127 Kodak, me holding a cigarette, and another with me puffing away. One with Peruccio, Perch, a gunner on the 219, writing a letter, a goofy guy named Griffin from Florida, sitting with me out on the lawn at Tokyo General Hospital, recovering from pieces of shrapnel no bigger than the head of a pin, in my case, embedded in my left eyebrow. Thought I'd gone blind. Some hero. Back in the fight three weeks later, no eye operation needed. Truce talks about the fighting and the dying went on. Business as usual. Spotted one of the, our cowboys, or one of our convoys, carrying the dead for burial. From the notes, stuffed with close friends, tighter now than ever, and rid of worldly cares. Each in case, snug and warm in his private G.I. wound. From here, they looked like so many mail sacks. And then, away from combat and awaiting shipment home via Tokyo for what civilians and the uninformed bureaucrats call rest and recuperation, but which we, the great unwashed, call intercourse and intoxication. <laughs> I ran into Louis Dodge at a movie house in Tokyo. Poor Louis Dodge, a half-mad career man, who threw himself into the latrine in the backside of our forward observer's hole. He refused to come out, and none of us would go in. And then our new captain, Sal Brichetto, drew his forty-five and fired in the air. Poor Louis Dodge, naked with a blanket around him, was driven away from the war. And then to run into him, of all people, in a theater lobby from 8,000 miles from home. Can't remember your name, but you and that red-headed Scotsman, Fraser was it? You came through for me. Glad to see you made it. Aboard ship, and two weeks later, we're in Fort Ord, California. Scraps of paper neatly folded, and these are just one-liners. When I was a chaffy, and someone yelled out, shut the hell up over there. That wireline signalman is good as dead. Raise those sights, Sergeant Cal. The forward observer says you're short. My God, what a fire. 3,000 rounds, and the breeches were painted black. They came at the infantry down there like pigs in a chute. Don't worry about the rookies. They won't survive this shit anyway. The laws of physics are then observed. Heat rises, and with it, the diesel fumes and the smell of the friendly dead. Hey, what happens if he walks this way? Shut up back there. I'm drunk, and so say all of us, Hat, for you're a jar good fellow, and whom none of us can rely. Not much of a war, I guess, but it served, and it was enough for us who were there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mentioned the last name Galvan, um, and this thing, if you all want to be writers and all that, and you want to get into it, it's a weird calling. <laughs> this piece I'm going to read to you, the first thing that came to me was a complete sentence. I don't think in complete sentence. None of us think in complete sentence. But this one is, and it was about... Charlie Galvan. This is a last visit with Charlie Galvan at the Veterans Medical Center. She, uh, and I wrote her in one, two, and four parts. This is the first part. Charlie and I are now in our 80s. I'm a free man, a widower. I live alone and need no help getting about. Charlie, though, has spent the last 40 years in a wheelchair, the result of a North Korean mortar, which also mowed down five of the guys. A bright, sunshiny day. Back in camp, our platoon leader, Lieutenant Tony John, identified the mortar as a Russian manufacturer. Eleven months on his back at Tokyo General, another 18 with a cane, and then, when age caught up with him, the chair. 
No complaints, not from Charlie Galvan. Back in 51, the platoon leader had called them a stalwart, although none of us knew what the word meant. The shape tail then added bulwark, but all we did was to look around at each other. It's an all right guy, men. One you can depend on, look up to, you know, a stalwart, a bulwark. And Charlie was that, I guess, but that was then. Now he couldn't carry a carbine, let alone that 30 caliber machine gun he lugged all over North and South Korea up to the mortar did his job. And so, once again, I'm here at the Waco Medical Center. His voice remains as strong as ever. Not so the legs, of course. But today is Charlie's day to choose the topic. Will it be books? How about a movie? Television? And we used to take imaginary trips. A trip, he says. Well, for two. We've taken so many. But after a pause, I say, how about Nada? You know, a visit to Admiral Yamamoto's place in and garden, a nod, and then, remember the flowers and nodder growing up in the streets? Now, how is that done? Flowers sprouting out of paved streets, strange people, the Japs. Charlie knows the former enemies of his older brothers are now called Japanese, but he remains in the early 50s, and Japs is good enough for Charlie Colorado. You remember how we turned down the invitation to visit Hiroshima after training? He begins to fidget. Sign has something to say. Charlie turns in his chair, focuses on a window where a pair of houseflies are hooked up as if making love. You and I have been friends since high school. We've held around here and there in Southern Hampshire. I nod. You never talk much then. And, and then his voice drops. Where are we going with this? I said, you. Well, what about me? Well, you're the only one who visits. Well, I was there, Charlie. He nods. Yeah, and we share type A blood, buddy. You know what? That makes us blood. We're kin. And he cackles as he shakes his head. I return to Nader. I can see it clearly. The poverty, the beggars, the onlys at the authorized whorehouses, and him in crutches, drunk and laughing. A long time ago, Ray's buddy. Remember the Jack World War II vet? The one with the aluminum leg made out of slits beer cans? <laughs> and wearing that damn tropical uniform in freezing weather and earning a living playing the accordion. I nod again. It's a long time ago, Charlie. But I got me an idea. I get money for being 100% disabled, and I've been saving it. No more imagining trips, Rafe. I want to go to Japan. I want to die there, there, where no one knows me. Hey, maybe I got a bastard son or two in old Japan, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just might. How you planning to go there? The white grin as if talking to a child. We'll fly, that's how. Who's the we? It's you. You and me like the old days. You got nothing to tie you down here. Sammy Joe died years ago. He's serious. And he's seriously ill. Cancer. You want me to bury you there? In Tokyo? Damn straight. Hell, if Sonny could make a home there, and he did, well, so can I. Permanently. What do you say? I'll pay my own way, Charlie. How does the Aoyama Cemetery sound to you, Charlie? Perfect. And he's grinning. Perfect, because that's where Basako and Tamiko are buried. Yeah, that goddamn fire at the Ernie Pyle Theater. Christ. Charlie looks out the window again. Can't last more than a month, they say. So you got to handle the logistics. There's no one else, Ray. I know. Don't forget to clap after the praying, all right? And I want lots and lots of cherry blossoms. You know, a first-class burial. Charlie Galvan, a native of Florida, Texas, died a week later, two weeks short of his 82nd birthday. Three months later, I landed at Narita Airport, booked a room, booked a room and took the ashes to the Aoyama Cemetery. After the prayers, an English-speaking caretaker took me to the grave sites of Masako Watanabe and Tommy Koshimori. It was a first-class burial. Thank you. Follow this. Up. If you want some things of explanation, some of the uh, terminology that I use, not the swearing, and you're older, old enough, <laughs> and you've been bad bars in your lifetime. Yes, sir. What was the first complete sentence? You mentioned that started with a complete sentence. <laughs> yeah, a last visit with Charlie Galvan at the very, and then it goes on, medical center, and then the subject comes. But I just took that. It's <laughs> a good question. Thank you, Tom. Yes, ma'am. Do you do, do you do a lot of revision? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love to edit. 
and uh, I have a daughter who doesn't edit. She doesn't edit my work. But I love to edit, and I think that you tend to overwrite, and all you have to do is just take the junk away from there, and then you, you what's there is what you really want to say in the first place. Yeah, yeah. If you don't rewrite, good Lord, I can't even imagine that. I don't know how to answer <laughs> Yes, sir. I yes, I you know, you have, you're, you're in the unique position of knowing, of having been around sort of at the beginning of the, <clears throat> of the era when Chicanos Mexicanos were getting published in the, in the States. And um, I wonder what you see, how it's been from the beginning up to now, what it looks like, how different, how much the same. Well, to begin with, in the academy, there were no Mexican-American centers, no Mexican-American institutes, no Mexican-American programs. That was one of the things that we set out to change. But this starts in California, not in Texas. And uh, this was not a university sponsored, this was not a UC system sponsored uh, affair. Uh, it was junior pros, assistant pros, maybe one associate, uh, senior graduate students, and some senior uh, undergraduate students and who funded and founded, at the same time, a literary journal. And they're the ones that published the very first anthology of Mexican-American literature called El Espejo, The Mirror. In fact, it was a bilingual uh, title. Then that caught fire uh, in Texas, and then it moved west again to New Mexico, small population, and then to uh, Arizona. But because of that, uh, Mexican-Americans have been in Chicago and working there since the agreement between Carranza and Wilson in 1918 uh, to bring meat cutters, butchers, railroad men, steel workers to Chicago. They were already publishing in Spanish. But nothing systematic, nothing to do with the academy. It was just part of the culture of those people. So we decided to learn from them how it was that they managed to uh, keep going and to publish stuff. And pretty soon uh, we received a huge grant from the Ford Foundation. And Arturo Madrid, who's now teaching at Trinity, uh, founded something called NC, well, National Chicano Council on Higher Education. And whenever we would mention the word council in Latin America, they thought we were church affiliated. <laughs> so we have to explain, no, this is just a regular thing. And all the men and women now, who are in their 50s at this age, you know, what's the, uh, 2011, uh, and full props and tenure or whatever, were recipients of the NCH uh, scholarships that Ford so generously gave us. So in great part, they are the ones that established the education in them. But this then led to politics, and more and more people uh, would come in and enter politics. In my hometown, my father was a member of the Democratic Party when Texas was a one-party state. And... You can vote Democratic, but it doesn't mean you're a member of the party. If you work for the party, you receive a salary because you garner votes and all that. And my dad was in charge of that. So he called Rudy Garza, and a man named Jesus Garcia, slightly older. He was already in his 30s. He had gone to Europe, as had Rudy. He said, you two boys are going to run for city councilman in Mercedes. Because what the majority population would do, they would uh, present their candidate. And then they would hire some Mexican-American to run against the official Mexican-American that people wanted, right? So they would dilute that vote. And Dad said, uh, you two are the ones who are going to run, and nobody else is. And this is how we did it. You don't have, have this education in Victoria anymore, I guess. But um, the, the ballots, the sample ballots were yellow and about this size. And with one party, well, some were crypt Republicans, I guess, but this is just a uh, Democratic Party. And I, my chore was, with a ruler this size, to scratch out the names of those who were, we didn't want to be voted for. Uh, C.C. Clayton for constable, good. The rest go down. <laughs> you know, Logan and Paxton for city, city council, ah, that's good. And you had to pay a poll tax. Don't forget, Texas is a southern state. We seceded, we were slaveholding, we charged to vote with a poll tax. We had separate but equal facilities. There's a myth. And that's how. So what Dad did, we had two cousins, half cousins. We had no full cousins, just those two. 
and then my two older, my older brother, older sister, and then another older sister, and then my brother and I. And they would drive the voters to vote. But how do they get the two dollars and fifty cents? Ah, the county seat, Corpus, uh, Edinburgh, Texas, with the machine over there by my name, Clooney, not George. <laughs> <laughs> that name is very Irish and quite common. And I remember the stacks of Roy Ten cigars. You remember those? Those of you smoke. Those my. But they were full of two dollars <laughs> with a fifty cent piece and a quarter, and they looked like salt water cash. <laughs> And they have people lined up two blocks around our house. And Rene my, and I, my older brother, uh, we'd go out there and give them the money. And then they would come in and they would get their poll tax. And the rest of the valley towns saw what Don Manuel, my daddy, had done. And by the 1960s, as I told my dad, and I was just wise ass anyway, I said, you know, we're Roman Catholic. Dad never did. The only time I saw my dad in church was when we buried him. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, but I told my dad, you know, we're Catholics, and I think we're going to outnumber these. And we did. I think we're saving like 84%. But what we needed was a cultural base, and that's when literature came. And that to us was very important. I mean, politics are for the older folk, but we in the academy wanted to get more people in the academy, see them guide them, give them some advice, and try to secure money or how to work, uh, you know, for scholarships and how to work. Just like that. And that started, I think the first publication that I read was Tomás Rivera, a uh, young man, now dead, unfortunately, who was a migrant worker until he was 19. Then his parents asked him to quit and to go to college, which he did. And he earned a baccalaureate and a master's at uh, what is now uh, Texas State University it used to be Southwest Texas State. And before that, it was a normal school for teachers and all that. And then he went to Oklahoma, married with a child, and he earned a Ph.D. there. And he became an assistant prophet to Little Sam Houston. And then he was hired at UTSA by Pete Flan. Uh, and Pete saw this man, and he said, or young man, and he said, well, he's somebody. He became associate dean, became an associate VP, and he was in law line to be a president at UTSA because Pete Flan was going to go to UT Austin to replace whomever was there. But what happened was that Arlie Thompson, who used to be in, uh, at Sam Houston State, wanted him in El Paso as a chief operating officer because Arlie said he was going to retire and then Tom would be the president of Utah, which we said, good Lord, president of a universe and part of the system. And he was there a year, expecting to go in there. Then he got an offer to become chancellor at UC Riverside. We said, he and I were conducting a two-week seminar in Mexico City. Not in Mexico City, in Puebla, which is south on the way to her. And he said, what do you think? I said, well, you don't want to go to Nampa. I said, you don't want to go to Sonoma. And you're already in El Paso. This is the UC system we're talking about. He already talked himself in, but he always sounded me out. See, I don't well, I should have been wise and said, ah, what the heck with it. But he took the job, served five years as a chancellor, wrote me back a long letter, said, we're taking the family to Hawaii, going to use the rest of the month, we're going to rest up and then go to Europe, and it's going to be great. He died after his fifth year as chancellor. It's just terrible. What we lost also was a great writer, because he had one short novel that is still being read and published and taught throughout the U.S., and it's... It's a good piece of work. He also wrote a book of poems. One about his dad. Uh, he always wore um, coveralls, but with the ties. What do you call those things? I'm... Suspenders. Sorry? Suspenders. Yeah, with suspenders. And they're hanging from a barn, and they're empty, of course, because they're being dried. And that's how he remembers his father, wearing those things all the time. And he wrote about that. But it wasn't modeling. It was a very strong poem. And it was very tender at the same time. So it began with politics by the older folk and then the young folk. What helped us also was the GI Bill uh, that uh, allowed the World War II veterans to attend. My brothers, for example, and our brother's friends. In our, in our little block, there were about 17 young men, uh, 15 of whom returned from Europe. And they went on to college, uh, physicians. I, I wrote uh, uh, the 
a prologue or forward to a, a study by Michelle Kells, uh, a UNM, uh, A&M graduate who's now teaching at, uh, at Albuquerque. And it's about the Garcia family. Uh, they were Mexican. She was a teacher. He was a, uh, a teacher of a public school. This is during the revolution, the last school, 1910 to about 1920, 21, off and on. And they come to Mercedes. And as we say in Spanish, they came here with one hand in front and one in back. That doesn't mean anything in English, but this is what it means. It's all they had. <laughs> one man, one hand in front or one arm in front. And uh, Pepe Antonio, Jose Antonio, became a physician, worked his way through UTEP, I mean through uh, Austin and then Galveston. His brother did the same. Uh, their sister, Clotilde, who was later a city commissioner in Corpus, uh, taught uh, grammar school in Mercedes for about eight years, saved her money, and then she became a physician. Two of the younger brothers also did. Uh, the third one died as an undergraduate at UT. So what an example. And, of course, we live right across the street, and we also produce well, five uh, university types. So it was education that we know, that we knew that politics would be handled by them, but we were going to do this. So... So just part of that. But the literature is something that I always wanted to do. Just, and that's why I'm here. Professor Gregory Park, if there's any students that need to go to a 1 o'clock class, they can do so. I won't be hurt. You've got to go to class. <laughs> that's a good idea. Because there's nothing more disheartening, you know, when everybody... <laughs> <laughs> no, I just picked this up. Man. They were talking. During the transition, I was like, I'm sorry, Houston. No way. And I'm Unbelievable. I know. Unbelievable. I like the little captions. Oh, it's great. <laughs> but it's, it happened. You have to it happened. Right? I mean, he wasn't. Yeah, he was a human. He was yeah. a human. <laughs> <laughs> How do we know that all of them have a class? <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. Ah, they do. One thing about university undergraduates. Ninety-nine percent of them completely honest. And I eat, too. They put up with us. So, there was a question. Yes, sir. I just have a comment on a question about Becky and her friends. Yeah. Very good read, especially when you had it laid out, each person uh, contributing to the story. But I do have a question about dedication, which reads, in particular, to everyone who has wished me ill luck. <laughs> As you can see, it's brought nothing more but brought nothing but more titles to the series. This should probably teach you a lesson but most likely it won't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now uh, kids are praised for just about everything. I can cross the street by himself. Um, and someone, when I told him I was going to be, in fact, we were talking about that, but in a more serious tone. Uh, I'm not encouraged to do anything. My parents knew we were all going to go to college because we had to work our way. But we had the GI Bill, so the girls were taken care of. You know. And uh, I got no encouragement. My parents, uh, they wanted me to be whatever I wanted. And my brother wanted to be a coach. I said, well, be a coach. And he was quite successful. His last name is also Enosa Smith. And we have a cousin, they're all retired now, uh, who was a football coach in Macallan. And his last name, was Morris Samora. <laughs> well, Samora and the uh, Hinojosa branch had married in a ranch called San Pedro Way, the heck out there, and you couldn't hire relatives. Remember that nepotism thing? Although they weren't nephews, but that's where the term comes from. And you couldn't hire them, and they did. So and Hank was a great coach at Mack High and Mack Allen Bulldog. And my brother was a great line coach, and he had won three championships for a little uh, Class A school called Sherryland. And he hired him, and he passed through flying colors. And I said, no one questioned the names? He said, no. 
class that somebody knew, and then we realized that somebody didn't know. But they said, how the heck with it? He's a good line coach. A football means more in Texas than a lot of other things. But the um, the makeup of Becky and her friends, um, I think I wrote it in Spanish. No, I wrote it in Spanish. Couldn't go on. And then I wrote it in English. And then when I came back, I set up an American split curriculum in Iraq in 89 before George the first. You know, did this thing over there. And uh, I came back and I finished it in Spanish. I was that summer. I also taught for two weeks at uh, Texas Women's University, but I didn't want a narrator. I did not want, you know, the first person or the third person or the reliable or the unreliable. Uh, very necessary things in writing, though. But I didn't want this here because this is a Mexican American woman was educated, upper middle class, Roman Catholic, in a small town, all of those pieces of luggage that she's caring about, decides that one day her husband is not going to live with her, and Charlie, and Sarah. That's it. All those things. And I said, who's going to tell the story? Well, I can, but it doesn't look right if I'm a man. Why do I act as a woman now? So what I did, I came up with about 36, 37 uh, characters, and each one talked for her decision or talked against her decision, given that she was, you know, educated with money and upper middle class and Catholic and first families and all of that stuff. And I have two priests, a young and an old Spaniard. They're both against it, but the young one is, you know, he may just even wind up uh, getting out of the church, I don't know. I, I don't even hint that in there, but when I was drawing him up, I said, well, he's, the day he ceases to believe, then he better just, you know, burn the suit and that's it. So I had no, uh, uh, my favorite character is a woman who's 95 years old and she's buried four husbands. And I said, now here's someone with experience. <laughs> and she's good, too. I mean, and it's all first person. But they all have distinct voices, right? men and women. And uh, it's very popular in Spanish, too. Los Amigos de Becky. Yeah. So the Spanish departments do it. Uh, but getting back to Douglas on this, now that I mentioned Spanish departments, they were highly recalcitrant. They did not want anything to do with Mexican-American literature, Chicano literature, nothing. And we said, fine, we'll go to English. Why? English are the most powerful uh, departments on campus, along with history. And the sciences, of course, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. And we said, no, we'll just go to English. And we have them in wherever they are. And we don't miss the Spaniards at all. <laughs> <laughs> They're very nice, you know, but you don't want nice people in the academy. Once. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and you and I go back a long time, so this better be a soft question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's one out of one out of respect. Um, your obra includes every possible genre: poetry, novels, short stories, uh, epistolary. Uh, which uh, style or genre do you find most uh, most enjoyable to to work? Yeah, usually the next novel that I'm going to write, whatever it is, it's uh, I make a choice. I said, what does Mexican American lit need? Well, we don't need another 19th century novel with a beginning and the linear end. You know, a with what is uh, when you stop it here to give exposition, and then you go on with the plot, then you stop it to give some more exposition, and then you come to the end. I didn't want that, so I came up with this in Spanish and English, just people just talking, uh, voicing their views. I also didn't want a main character in the first and the and second novel. And the first novel is uh, what we call dynamic. It just moves all over the place, and it's not linear. But I didn't want uh, a main character. So I made the people from that little town the main character. And then the second novel, I made the people from the county, because I had invented the little town and then the county, uh, also, so, uh, and then I said, what we don't have is a detective story. In 85, when the violence begins along the border that we don't read about in the paper, but now you can't even get enough on TV 
do. Um, I said, well, we need a detective story now. I followed that up 13 years later in 98. The third novel was from Korean Love Song. I wanted to show us in uniform and fighting and falling or being discharged and then leading some sort of life, productive or not productive. I was not going to uh, paint this, you know, in a nice pink hue. It was going to be just the way some people came back and didn't do anything. Others who did come back. And uh, whenever I start to write something, um, I say, well, what is it that we need in this literature? We need everything, every genre in English. So, because the word novel means something new. I mean, it's an Italian invention, and that's the Spanish term. And that's what it means, algo nuevo, something new, and it's novel. So, um, the last novel I published, and it's promised already to a good friend here, Charlie Alcorn, it's an academic novel. There's quietness here. <laughs> No, you're not in it. <laughs> but it is an academic novel. So I gave it a very Shakespearean title. It's called We Happy Feet. And from Henry and his harangue. Harangues are still being used in the Army. We used to get harangued all the time uh, by a Texan from... Do you all know where Belson is? Yeah. Well, he, was there. he was a good general. MacArthur hated him, but he was a good general. Johnny Walker. His name was Walton. But because of Walker, Johnny, you know, and I think he drank, but he drank. And so I said, well, I have to do all of this. Show us in uniform. Show us out of uniform. Show us in jail if we need to be there or whatever. So it's a great question, too, because it just allows me to do whatever it is that I want to do. And uh, then we wrote, then I wrote this one with Nora Narrator, but with the 30 odd, very odd at times, uh, speakers there. So whatever comes up, I've not written an academic novel. I don't think anybody has in the field. This is all right. Yeah, there it is. It's a small uh, <clears throat> third rate, although the dean says it's second rate. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a compliment um, of, of, of a university in a small town. But it all takes place in Belkin County, which is imaginary, just as imaginary as anything. Uh, and how similar is Belkin County to Cameron or Hidalgo County down in the Rio Grande Valley? Pretty soon. I mean, pretty, pretty. Well, it's, uh, it's a reflection, but it's not reality because it's fiction. <laughs> but a lot of people, I've been very fortunate to know a lot of people because of the politics that my dad was engaged in. And, you know, and I used to spend my summers in South, not in South Tio, that's the capital of Coahuila, in the village of 1800. I was... Was I talking, were we talking about this this morning? 1,800 souls in this town. And they reminded me of my hometown. And I wrote my very first story. I wrote in high school, created bits, because you had two great English teachers. You were a junior, you could write whatever you wanted, you were a senior. Then you would also, essays, articles, uh, poetry. I wrote one very hypocritical uh, essay against smoking. I was 16, and you know I was puffing away just like every teenager at the time. Uh, but in this village, I wrote my first about two uh, farmhands who were going home uh, after a hard day's work. And then the levy for the young, L-E-V-Y, those soldiers or sailors out in the high seas who just grab you and put you in the service. Remember the War of 1812 was because of the levy of American soldiers into the British uh into the Royal Navy. And if they're taken away by by this levy that's coming by, their their family will starve. They'll starve. So they run. And one of them uh, has his arm hacked off by a saber, and he falls in this great irrigation dish that we had him running up front. That water was cold as anything. It came from the mountains, and it would just, it's a great agricultural area in the northern Mexican state of Coahuila. And uh, he falls there. And I was I think, talking to you, maybe just thinking myself. I said, 20 years later, I'm in college, because I'm just a, a bright teenager at the time. And I said, hell, I wrote symbolism. Because <laughs> <laughs> the blood takes him all over Mexico. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. But you're lucky as a writer. You, you hit on something once in a while. So I do everything I can, sure a different genre, or something that is lacking that we need. Korean love songs is not poetry. It's verse. Right? Yeah. And uh, 
Then there's also the fourth novel, which is called A Fair Gentleman of Belkin County, but has appeared in English Spanish also. Uh, Claros Varón is the Belkin. And that comes to the Spanish medieval writer uh, Hernández Pulgar back in the 12th, the 12th century. And that one, it, the soldier's coming back from Korea. And this is the only novel that I start the whole chapter and dedicate the whole chapter to the geography of the place. After four of her novels, finally, I uh, began to try. He notices the strawberry fields, the onion fields, the people out there sowing crops for something else. And, and then I the uh, talk about the, uh, or describe the orange, <coughs> grapefruit, tangerine, tangelo, all the citrus fruit that's grown in the valley. And the reason I did is because the kid is looking at it now with brand new eyes. He's been in the Orient, and now he's coming back to familiar ground, and he realizes that he never appreciated what it was that he was, or where he was living when he came back. So it begins with that. Yeah. I don't read my old stuff, by the way. Do we have time for one more? Oh, goodness. I want to know more about you. I think the students would enjoy hearing about, a little bit about your background. Well, let's bring them back. <laughs> and I want to know true passion, writing, what about teaching? Or I love teaching. Tell us a little about yourself. I come yourself. from a family of teachers. My grandmother, was teacher, my mother, my two sisters, my brother and I. The other one was a stone bureaucrat. When did you write that one? I think I must have been 14 when I wrote that thing in Spanish in that village that my parents would send me to. 1,800 people in that village. And I was telling Charlie that 1,800 people. And at night, we were so high. No one wore a jacket, even in June and July. And you could see Saltillo below us. And uh, we had a big church, good-sized church, but no priest. So he would just come to bury and marry, you know, baptize them, that type of stuff. So he'd come maybe he'd drive in once a month. We had a post office that opened twice a week. A pharmacist, the pharmacist. We had the postmaster, the, you know, and the pharmacist, Mr. Gasha, Senor Gasha, who had a sign right there that said, I don't have a license. <laughs> he doesn't have. He, he, was, a very, he was very excited. I, I practiced God a lot. <laughs> but you took your chance. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but I love to teach. And ha having those models, my older brother and my two older sisters, and uh, my mom. My mom taught for three years, and she buried and began raising. So she raises all of that. And, uh, but I love to teach. And I love to try new things. And if the kids go with it, then we'll follow that out. It doesn't always work. You have to have, it depends on whom you're going to have facing. Uh, I don't do much talking. Uh, I give them my lectures. Each one has a copy of my lecture. Two pages, single spaced. I read it. They read it with me, but they also hear it. And then they get to keep it. I don't wander off all over the place. And then I make them into teams of two, sometimes teams of three if the theme is a little bit uh, needs more expanding. And they talk to each other. And one of them is taking notes, and then the other one will write down, and then they will read it in front of the class to see what they got out of that novel that I've been explaining. The background of, but not what it's about. And as for writing, well, uh, I, I hate to bore uh, Ms. Alcorn, because we had lunch and breakfast this morning. I talked about my two English teachers. And I remember in many essays, I'll, forever, I'll be forever grateful to them. It was uh, Ms. Merrill Blankenship. Rigorous. You know, but you had to go through her. There were only two English teachers. Freshman sophomore and then Amy Cordy, who taught junior school. And they were good. And they had this program called Creative Bits. And once you were a junior and a senior, then you could... Uh, and I wrote... Uh, I was shameless as one of when I was reading it the other day or trying to. I, I knew exactly who I was reading when I wrote that thing. I mean, I knew exactly who I was. I said, oh, hell, this comes from H.C. Whitworth. And you say, who? He was a sports writer and very good. He's dead now. He used to write boxing stories. Not that I like boxing that much, but I like the way. So you can always tell if you look at your teen years when you were writing. You said, oh, yeah, this is Hemingway, you know, tough and all that stuff. But it's good. You have to copy someone. <laughs> but the other thing that has helped, it was
was because I come from a family of readers. My mom read to my dad. He read to her. And uh, we read. I, I thought everybody read. And I'll close now because I know it comes a theme with <laughs> Run in hand. Uh, but it's, it's just the way it is. It's, uh, you write and you read and you publish. Remember I told you at breakfast this morning? I was 40 years old when I received my first check. How's that? And I've been writing and throwing away stuff. I wasn't about to submit it. I thought it was horrible. But at the time, I was writing. So, I did. And then, I turned nasty. I Xeroxed about 15 or 20 letters and sent him off. He said that I would never be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> it is very sad. It is sad because they don't talk to you. That's great. Thank you. There's a big question. Thank you very much. Uh, book signing, y'all. Um, I want to point out one thing. I was a little too quick in my introduction here. That the uh, American Book Review this week has put out an issue. Um, the focus is Latino West. I, I call it the Mexican issue. Um, Dagoberto and Ricardo Gill um, put it together. It, it's a marvelous uh, collaboration. It's in celebration of uh, the launch of Central Victoria. It's also a unique document. We also thank David Feltz, who behind the scenes has been working. Uh, very hard. American Book Review does all the posters here. And, you know, David, everyone else is up front uh, enjoying the, your work. But thank you for all that. Um, this is our, our last uh, event for the year. It's been a great year, a great way to end it. Um, there's some refreshments if the, if the students didn't uh, eat all the cooking and stuff out. But thank you all for coming. Let's have another round of applause for our
Although, you know, I think this is the battery the ship's going to get. Yeah, exactly.